Hello, uh, my name is Samuli Kusela, and together with Amit Svariko, we are going to present uh, securing a network virtualized with containers and Kubernetes. So I work in, in Ericsson as an implementation architect in the CTO office, uh, focusing on security. And uh, Amy will uh, introduce herself. So we are going to talk about uh, isolation, then about container signing and especially on Notary v2. And uh, Amy will cover sys benchmarks, operating a service mesh, and uh, securing managed apps in an SMO. Okay, uh, this is my main topic uh, as of my part, uh, isolation. And uh, first, let's have a look at uh, figure, which is uh, inspired uh, from a Google blog post. I think this is a pretty good uh, overall figure. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to um, explain all of the, the Kubernetes uh, terminology. So straight to the point, um, I would introduce by saying that um i often hear and, and maybe you as well have heard uh, um, statements like uh, containers are not as secure as vms uh, so i think that the statement is often referring to isolation and actually <clears throat> i think there is also a maybe a too optimistic or maybe a bit unrealistic uh, assumption behind that statement so we will come back to that statement uh, after uh, in the end of this isolation part so let's start to look at this uh, isolation um, in more detail so starting from uh, containers uh, the innermost uh, part here uh, that is a uh, uh, like it says, there is some isolation, but uh, kind of not very much. Uh, then there is pod, and and by the way, you, you can have like uh, like here it is multiple containers in a pod. Then again, you can have multiple pods in a namespace. The namespace can uh, span um, across many nodes. And of course, you can have multiple nodes in one cluster. So, so that's the kind of architecture. Uh, so, going from container to pod, uh, it it also has, uh, like it says, some some more isolation, um, and the namespace has some specific uh, aspect of isolation. For example, on the service account. And uh, then we come to the node, which is uh, basically a virtual machine or or, uh, or hardware. And of course, then it has uh, stronger isolation. And finally, on the cluster level, it is uh, well, strongest isolation, obviously. So let's move on and uh, then we have some i want to just briefly mention uh, some of the the let's say improved isolation like um, on on this uh, kubernetes stack so there are something like uh, micro vms uh, running containers in micro vms which are basically uh, lightweight virtual machines so the, the limitation here is that uh, those are not really, so to say, mainstream at the moment. There are some, some specific solutions and, and for example, in, in certain public clouds, we can see those like uh, AWS Firecracker and, and Google GVisor, for example. Uh, then the next point here on the right side is about uh, that uh, you could, of course, you could build uh, 
something on top of Kubernetes. Like uh, as an example here, Red Hat OpenShift uh, has multi-tenancy built on top of Kubernetes and is actually providing uh, tightened isolation and, and security controls. Um, however, from um, let's say average CNF point of view, it, it may pose some challenges. I mean, like deploying a CNF in OpenShift with, let's say, the tight security controls and multi-tenancy on can be some challenges, like, like if the CNF, in, installing the CNF, for example, if it requires uh, uh, Kubernetes admin privileges, that might be, might or might not be a violation of, of the policies of that particular deployment of OpenShift. Right, so then I would like to present briefly some of the ongoing activities in this area. <clears throat> so in CNTT Kubernetes reference architecture, we have, uh, we have had quite some activity and uh, is, still, uh, is still ongoing. So for example, there are now some documented gaps on multi-tenancy <clears throat> and workload isolation with Kubernetes. I mean, gaps like uh, basically that, that Kubernetes itself doesn't provide uh, as high degree of isolation as, as for example, a VM or bare metal. Uh, I, there is also a pull request, at least a uh, few days ago, was still open which is about describing best practices for uh, workload isolation with Kubernetes. And here one input was, was a recent open dev uh, conference and the conclusions in there. Uh, then I can just mention very briefly that uh, similar type of proposals <clears throat> or con conclusions we have, for example, in HCNFV. And, and by a telco regulator. I mean, these are just preliminary and not, not yet, so to say, public, but basically saying that you should not uh, isolate workloads in, in different trust domains by, by means of Kubernetes and, and container isolation. But basically, you should. Uh, then use VM or, or bare metal based isolation between different trust domains. Also, the Google blog post from where this, this uh, figure was as well uh, is, is stating like that in, in certain uh, cases you should really rely on, on uh, VM or bare metal. And, and then there is one, this learn. Kubernetes.io. So essentially, we uh, by by in these references, you could summarize that in in certain cases you should deploy multiple clusters for isolation. I mean, uh, yeah, isolation between trust domains. And uh, then this this uh, right side is. It's not about security, but I, I wanted to mention it briefly because it is uh, related. It's actually pointing to the same uh, thing that is down here that you, you maybe need to deploy multiple clusters. And in, in this case, it's not about security, but it's simply that, um, let's say, a typical CNF, whatever that then is. But anyway, it, it might include some cluster-wide software. I mean that the CNF has been integrated with, with cluster-wide software like uh, service mesh, uh, ingress controller, or, or logging framework that have been integrated to the CNF in the, in the development of the CNF. And uh, or may, CNF may need to define some global resources like this. Uh, custom resource definition CRDs. So if you pick a number of, of CNFs, which include these, 
let's say software or properties you and and you want to deploy them in a single cluster you might very well uh, end up with conflicting versions of these these software or or different different configurations of these and and as you may uh, see it, it could also become very complex regarding the software lifecycle management within that single cluster if you somehow manage to to anyway deploy these different cnfs with uh, with uh, dependencies to to the cluster wide software so for more details i i have here a link to a cntt issue on on, on this topic <clears throat> and finally very briefly i wanted to mention about container signing and and uh, especially notary v2 so as of now there are some signing solutions in in for containers but no industry standard standard for example red hat simple signing and docker content trust these are these are open source solutions but uh, those are not supported by let's say every registry but but more like in in some specific deployments uh, you see these these to be used notary we do too then uh, i i see it as uh, as having potential to become an industry standard uh, so it had kickoff last year and it includes uh, like you see uh, uh, many many uh, big players in this area uh, are behind this project and the goals mentioned here also are, are that they are aiming high let's say uh, so in the end it, it really aims to be something that is supported by by all the registries and uh, there is also a link to a scenario document so I think uh, to to ensure that the telecom related use cases would also be, be covered, telecom players should uh, join into this project. And, and as of now, that is not yet the case. So I hope to to see that happening. And uh, now over to Amy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amy Swarico and I'm from AT&T and I'm now going to turn to the nuts and bolts of hardening the containerized network environment. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about some industry best practices, um, specifically the Center for Internet Security or CIS, their Docker and Kubernetes benchmarks. I'm then going to talk about operationalizing a service mesh network. And I'll end the talk with an example of how to use the, the various techniques we've talked about through in this talk for securing the use of managed applications within an open RAN or ORAN deployment. Um, the Center for Internet Security has a set of practical and also testable benchmarks for securing both Docker and Kubernetes. Um, plus the benchmarks include scoring metrics so you really can measure how well you're doing. Um, as you can see on the table on the left, there's each of the benchmarks has a little better than 100 controls to implement, which um, granted seems like a lot, but the good news is none of them are particularly difficult to implement or to implement the tests. Furthermore, once you've implemented the patterns and tests, you really can reuse them in all of your deployments. And finally, there are some commercial tools available that, that actually implement some of the tests. So the Docker example is from the container image and build controls. Um, containers shouldn't run as root unless they have to perform a task that can only be done as root. By default, containers are run with root privilege, and they also run as root within the container. So that needs to be fixed. Um, to meet the benchmark, the container should always set their user to a non-zero UID value. And then to test that the user is set during build, make sure that you include a blocking test in your build pipeline that makes sure the container does not have a UID of zero or that's in an exception list of the containers that have to have root privilege. We know that that, that happens. Um, 
This test can also be periodically executed in the runtime environment to make sure that the UID didn't actually change. Um, the Kubernetes example is the enforcement of rate limits on the control plane API server. This prevents the cluster from being overwhelmed by placing a limit on the number of events that the API server will accept during a given time slice. It's an important control because a misbehaving workload could actually overwhelm the server and make it unavailable. And that's basically a denial of service attack. Um, additionally, it, it becomes even more important in multi-tenant clusters where there might you might have just a couple of, of cluster tenants that are misbehaving and they impact the overall cluster performance. Like the UID not being set to zero, um, rate limiting is not turned on by default. And so as in the Docker example, it is a straightforward configuration and the test that checks the uh, that checks it is to just make sure that the enable admission plugins argument is set to a value that includes event rate limit. Now, our, our recommendation is that virtualized networks that use Docker and Kubernetes should all try to meet all of the benchmarks, so they would have a perfect benchmark score. And where you have containers that need weaker controls, um, make sure that you include them in, that you document why, and that you include them in some type of a whitelist that you use during testing, and that you periodically, think, you periodically review this whitelist to make sure that those, those controls are still needed. Um, I'm now going to turn to the service mesh architecture. Service mesh is um, very popular these days. There's a lot of people doing work in it. Um, and it really provides some really in, some interesting security controls. Um, one of the products that you've probably heard of is Istio that does the implementation. So what is a service mesh? It, it's really a dedicated infrastructure layer that facilitates service-to-service -service communication within a containerized architecture. It takes the logic governing the service-to-service -service communication, and it actually moves it out of the individual services or the application containers. And it abstracts it to another layer of infrastructure. Um, we call this a service mesh container, which is this yellow, this yellow box. Um, I'm really only going to focus on externalizing the interface security controls, uh, such as authentication, encrypted communication, or TLS, your RBAC controls, event logging, and certificate management. Um, there are a number of other controls that the service mesh enables, um, but those are not security related. So the diagram on the slide is actually an abstraction of a service mesh architecture. Um, and it, it, the fo you should really focus on this service mesh container, or it's sometimes called a sidecar. And it's going to implement all of your security controls. Um, just as a note, um, I intentionally excluded the depiction of the PodNet and ServiceNet components that are part of each node, um, just to make the picture a little more simple. So you can see in this picture that the TLS is no longer managed by the application. Um, instead, it's managed by the service mesh container. And additionally, the container is, is got the RBAC in it, and it's got all of your logging in it. Um, what this really helps is that it has removed all of that work from the application development team, and it's moved it, it it's externalized it. And this also enables you to have a, a very uniform implementation of your of your interface security because all of your service can you can reuse the same service mesh container. So it's really straightforward to deploy with Istio and other service mesh implementations because they typically include some type of an internal certificate authority and they have automated provisioning implemented. Um, They've got a user store for managing RBAC. They've got logging capabilities. Um, plus, they typically have a lot of integration with open source products. Um, one example is Keycloak to use it for your user management, which would also cover the RBAC, and also some type of an ELK stack for doing log management. All right, so you've got this great service manage, uh that you can use. You've worked on it in the lab. You're, you, it's great. Um, and now you go to run it in your production environment. So I've skipped a slide. Um, and the problem here is that you're going to have to integrate that service mesh with your enterprise security platforms. You can't just use the out-of-the-box services. 
So what does that entail? You're going to need to start with your certificate management. Um, you're going to need to select the CA that manages your certificates. So it might be a public CA. Um, it might be an internally managed private CA. That's, that's pretty typical in an operator environment. But in either case, it is a CA that has a root of trust. So you're going to have to make sure that the CA roots and intermediates are installed within the service mesh container. Plus, you're going to have to make sure that you can automatically install an actual client cert within the service mesh container. Um, and to do that latter step, you're going to need to make sure that you've got some type of an, a certificate management protocol, such as CMPB2 or ACME, integrated with the mesh so that you can automate your certificate enrollment and renewal. And finally, you do need to make sure that this is all integrated with your corporate identity lifecycle management platform or ILM platform uh, to make sure that you don't inadvertently um, configure a certificate in some type of a rogue process. So now speaking of ILM, large companies, especially operators, typically have mature ILM and access control systems. So you're going to need to manage to integrate with those um, because and that's your RBAC part. Um, and you need to do that integration to make sure that your RBAC rules actually are, are correctly managed and that they are not granting privileges to applications that shouldn't have them. Now, in some cases, your RBAC, is, your RBAC rules are still going to remain resident within the service mesh implementation. In some cases, they're going to be externalized to some type of a centralized access management platform. And that's going to require another integration point. Um, the good news here is that typically ILM and access control integrations are via an LDAP. So it's, it's a straightforward integration. Um, the third consideration is actually integration with centralized logging. So the service mesh is great because it simplifies the collection of transaction and event logs. Um, however, when you run this, when you're running in a production environment and you have a production network, you need to get all of those transactions out into your um, integrated log management platform because that's where your operations people do all of their monitoring and their alerting. Again, this is a pretty straightforward integration because it uses a standard protocol like syslog. And finally, the last thing I want to bring up about the work you have to do isn't an integration, but it's really your planning and, um, and integration and training. You've got to account for several months to do that on your initial, sorry, your initial service mesh deployment. Um, I want to point out one thing that is kind of a little bit of a, might be a gotcha with the service mesh in this environment is that when you're talking about network functions, they have to expose both a management interface as well as their functional interfaces. And typically those two interfaces are exposed on different networks. So you have to make sure that, that your service mesh deployment accounts for that and can connect to different networks. I'm going to end with a proposal uh, and an example of how you can take all of the technologies we've been talking about and use them to secure, um, to secure um, an ORAM deployment that uses, in which the ORAM service management and orchestration, or SMO, can be augmented by a managed application called an RAP. Um, now, just a little bit about RAPs. They can be developed by either a CNF vendor, they can be developed by a network operator, or even come out of an open source community. And they really represent a very powerful paradigm shift because they allow an operator to add new capabilities that are independent of their CNF and NF management providers. They can add those capabilities to their RAM or radio access network. However, um, that ability does introduce some new security risks. So if we take the Kubernetes and the service mesh um, and some of the other techniques, those can really help you effectively isolate these managed applications and reduce the overall risk. Um, container signing can prevent malware from being included as well. Um, as a side note, it's really important to assure when you pull in one of these managed apps that they are actually um, performing as you expect, but that's outside the scope of this talk. So the diagram on the right, or sorry, on the left, is, an ORAM, is the ORAM community's <coughs> proposed architecture for including an RF in the non-real-time RIC 
or, and that's a RAN intelligent controller, which is part of the service management and orchestration. Um, I want to note that these R apps can, um, they can leverage uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques, along with other data and analytics from the RAN, and their purpose is to help manage the RAN. So in this architecture that's on the left, you can see that the R app is meant to only communicate via something called the R1 interface. Um, thus, the R app's access to the SMO, to RAN mediation and control, to data, and any external machine learning or AI is always going to be moderated by the non-real-time RIC. And this architecture provides the foundation for the secure use of the R apps. Now, the diagram on the right is a proposal of how we isolate these R apps by deploying it within a service mesh. And that service mesh is only going to expose the R1 interface. Furthermore, the SMO and the non-real-time RIC will also each be isolated by, via a service mesh with well-defined interfaces. Um, the interfaces between them are represented by the double arrow. And then they have interfaces by which they talk to the other pieces of the RAM. Um, and as you can see, the non-real-time RIC is going to mediate all of the requests from the R app. And the SMO will mediate all of the requests from the non-time RIC. So you have a lot of layers of security in place. Now, turning back to what else does the, do we expect from the R app? So first, it's got to be packaged as a hardened container. So following the CIS Docker benchmarks, and it needs to be signed by an authority that the operator trusts. So each managed R app also has to be able to run within the hardened Kubernetes environment. So that goes back to the Kubernetes benchmarks. Um, make sure that each R app runs within its own cluster and it is separated from the non-real-time RIC, the SMO, and any other R apps in your environment. And finally, the R app communication has to be restricted to only that R1 interface. So this is very high level and there are gonna be lots of details to getting it done, but the service mesh with these highly restricted interfaces, a mediating non-real-time RIC, uh, the enforcement of Docker and Kubernetes benchmarks, and container signing really provide important layers to safely augment this SMO functionality with the managed R app. Thanks a lot, and Samuli and I can now answer some questions. I see that there's one question, Smully. I think it's for you. And the question is, which features are missing from Notary V2 and which ones should we work on? Yeah, uh, right. I, I actually typed one answer there. So basically, <clears throat> I don't have a very concrete or a direct uh, list of, of what is missing. I mean, Notary V2 is in quite early stage now. And maybe there are a bit still uh, kind of different kind of uh, different kind of uh, directions uh, still in that that initiative a bit. But uh, one thing came to my mind: uh, it, it might be that the target solution, as it kind of looks now, an estimate of of what it would be, it could be a bit maybe too complex for private registries, for example, a registry at a uh, service provider environment. But I mean, I, I don't have really a very concrete items to, to list here. And then there was one really quick thing um, that we need to get these slides uploaded someplace. We've had, I think, two different people ask about that. So, yeah. Yes, we will get the slides up, uploaded. Now we have actually a new question as well, but it says, hi, Samuli and Amy. So I don't know if there will be some <laughs> something uh, more. Uh, let's see. 
So, okay, we anyway are going to continue the conversation on the cloud native networking channel number two on the Slack workspace after this session will close here pretty soon. So, um, so yeah, okay, John has a question for, maybe for you, Amy, about SMOs. I don't know if you can still take it. Um, for some SMOs, let's see. Okay, the question was for uh, an RF might want to inject functional changes into the SMO, inject a CDA, CDS, or add change to policy framework. How will R1 work in this case? Um, That's probably a longer answer than we should give here. Um, I will continue trying to get onto the Slack channel, but John, I'll. I'll Keep a copy of this. 